Um, so with us tonight, we have executive producer Barry Josephson. Um, we have Jamie Bell, who plays Abe Woodhall. Samuel Rukin, who plays Captain Simcoe. And author Alexander Rose, who wrote the book that this show is based on. Um, so first for Barry, um, you know, for those audience members who maybe haven't seen the show, or obviously no one's seen any of season two aside from what we just saw, um, I know that you guys kind of experienced a little uptick in the ratings at the end of season one, so what can you say about you know, where the show left off and historically what events are going to be depicted in season two? Sure, I think the interesting thing, season one, nobody who would tune in would know who or what the Culper Ring was. So the idea of this spy unit, nobody understood, nobody knew anything. A big part of season one was, it, one was explaining each individual character, what was their situation, what was the dilemma for Abe, the dilemma for everybody. So season one sort of explores the introduction of these characters and you know, how they fit into history. Um, season two is very different because now we now know who they are. They are very committed to their cause. I think one of the great things that happened in season one was we did have that ratings uptick and, and an audience that became loyal and grew and talked about the show because as people learned more about the spies and their missions and their connection to Washington, the show was something I think a little bit easier to grasp. Mm -hmm. And you know, Alex, kind of going off of that, as a historian, what was so fascinating to you about this particular aspect of the revolution and the Culper Ring itself when you were researching this book and when you decided to undertake it? You know? um, well, the, I think the most interesting, well, the thing that struck, struck me most, um, you know, uh, the most was that it, it was such an obvious subject, you know, sort of spying during the revolution. I mean, that's an automatically kind of sexy subject. And I had originally assumed that it had been done you know, a billion times before, and in fact, it hadn't. It just it seemed to be kind of overlooked. Um, I think it was just because it was so obviously such a good subject that everyone just assumed everyone else had already done it. So that, that's what sort of really got me, and that, uh, that's what particularly attracted my agent, I think, um, and the publisher. So, uh, you know, that, that we sort of have this sort of, you know, slightly um, potentially fertile field here that hadn't really been plowed before. Yeah. You, you speak in the book about how, even though this is centuries ago at this point, that the techniques that they used were actually pretty advanced for the time. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. I mean, the, the stuff you see nowadays, you know, I mean, the stuff, the weird thing is about the culprits is that the, the sort of the techniques and the methods they used are actually would be considered the sort of child stuff nowadays, you know, like invisible ink and, uh, you know, sort of little code words and all that kind of stuff. This stuff you see, my, my, you know, I have a, a small child and he loves that stuff. But at the time, in the 18th century, there were no, um, you know, espionage, um, there was no espionage apparatus, there was no, there were no institutions, um, there was no way of learning how to spy. Um, you basically just had to make it up as you went along. It was all very ad hoc. Um, so what the, the, the culprits did, they used the most advanced techniques available at the time. And that was what was so sort of amazing about them, I think. Um, and that it's, it's just, uh, you know, they sort of had to learn as they went and they made mistakes. And that's what, you know, we show in the book. And, but at the end of the, end of the day, they triumphed. Yeah. Um, so Jamie, in researching the real life Abe Woodhull, what sort of things did you come across and how did you kind of identify with him as a character when you were researching this? I think, I think the truth is if you know anything about a spy, something about him, it means they probably got caught. You know, we know Nathan Hale because he was, he's dead. It's a good thing that Abraham Woodall wasn't caught. You know, we know nothing about him because he was a good spy. He was good at what he did. I think because he was so ordinary, it's so every man, he just blended into the tapestry of the time. I mean, he was a farmer. He was a family man. Um, aside from these very basic, primitive things from history, we have really nothing else to go off of. So Barry, Craig, Alexander as well, probably heavily dramatized the character, came up with things, you know, like the father thing, the, 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 the divide of the family, stuff like that is really dramatized to really give something more to the show and I think it does it really well. I think that really highlights something about this war very specifically is that this did divide people. Not everyone was on the side of the Americas. You know, I, I think this really was a, a tug of war between a younger brother and an older brother. 
you know, trying to fight for separation. Yeah. Um, and so, Barry, you know, what, how much dramatic license do you take with the history? And Alex, do you kind of act as a consultant on that? You know, what's, what's the level of truth versus fiction in, in the events that are depicted in season one and season two? Uh, you know, Craig Silverstein, who's our showrunner and the creator of the show, does a brilliant job, I think, of, you know, much is known, and that's what's great about Alex's book, and much is unknown. So I think Craig and Michael Taylor, who's here tonight, they take great advantage in our writing staff of filling in those blanks of what's unknown and creating the drama. The, the things that happen in the show historically are right on the money. Um, the characters, what we know of Abe Woodhull, what we know of Benjamin Talmadge, what we know of Caleb Brewster, what we know of Anna Strong, what we know of Simcoe, what we know of the characters we've tried to bring into the show. I think Craig's done a great job with that. But so much is unknown, so it allows for you to have dramatic license. I mean, in, I, I've often said that in any great you know, historical movie, um, you know, even a movie like Patton, you know, it's based on Omar Bradley's book, but, on, but, on, but they do take a lot of license to sort of let you know who the character is. And I think we do that very well here, because I think people need to see who they are as people, need to know what their relationships were, and, and what the conflicts and the rubs and all of the great stuff that happens between the people themselves in this very tense situation. Yeah. So, so Samuel is... What, from what you know of Simcoe, is he really as bad as, <laughs> as you play him? <laughs> and he gets much worse in season two, by the way. Well, well if you ask anybody in Canada, they'll say absolutely not. Because uh, he's, he's a, he's he a national a lake named hero after there. Him yeah. or um, no, I mean, uh, it's exactly what Barry said. There's a certain amount of information which uh, you can get your hands on, which is uh, tangible and useful. And, you know, there's. But, you know, there's, there's a whole um, journal that Simcoe wrote. But it's all written in the third person, which is a little odd. Um, <laughs> but then he is a little odd uh, on the show. So, you know, and, um, and it's sort of very factual. So as an actor, that's kind of useful um, general background, but it doesn't necessarily give you the human qualities that help you bring a character off the page and, and onto the screen. So... Um, you know, there's, there's a, you know, we, all the actors on the show do m masses of, of research to, to make sure that we understand the world that we're living in and, and, and absorb as much information about our characters as we can. And then there's a certain point where you have to put the history book down and, and the script becomes your Bible rather than the, um, than the history book. And, and, and I think having a healthy balance between the two is, is the most important thing for the actors anyway. And, um, you know, and obviously there's, there's things that are very useful in the history. Um, and then there's, um, you know, gems that come through from the writing team. So we use those as, they're, they're as high on the agenda as the history for us. Do you, I mean, as an actor, do you think that there's any sort of human quality to Simcoe that you can identify with? Or are you just sort of enjoying playing this sadist? Abs absolutely. <laughs> well, you know, I don't think... Um, Anybody is, is just um, evil or, or just loving or just nice, you know. Human beings are complicated and, uh, and they're also, in, and they're, it's in a very complicated context, which is a war. And, um, you know, if we've got it right, you know, these characters are three dimensional. And um, yes, this is a guy that has a completely different moral code. Um, has a completely different um, take on what discipline is and when it should be used and how, and how it should be used. Um, <clears throat> but in each of those moments, he's acting in a way that he feels is, is right and just. And, um, and, and that's, as an actor, what you, what you focus on. Because I think if you, if you make a decision, oh, this, you know, I'm going to play this, this guy as an evil guy right now, I don't think it would have the effect that I think it's having. I think you know, you focus on the, on the human, uh, the whole human sphere of who, who he is, and, um, and, and then hopefully the rest of it takes care of itself, yeah. Um, I don't know what it says about human nature that Sam enjoys playing the character so much. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it comes, su it comes surprisingly love easy. It. Loves it, loves, <laughs> you know, it. loves it. I worry myself, but, you know. Yeah. Disturbingly easy. Yeah, some would say. <laughs> anyway. Um, so, Jamie... Um... Sorry, I just remember we're in an Apple store. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on here? 
I think there'll be people wandering in and out. No, I need a new phone kit. This is good. <laughs> <laughs> you are always breaking your screen. I am. I am. I am. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Go on. Go on. No, sorry. Right. Um, so, you know, obviously Abe kind of reaches a turning point at the end of season one. So if you can kind of rehash that a little bit for some people who maybe haven't seen the show. And also, do we see Abe 2.0 in season two? Like, does he... Does he have a different mindset going into the second season? Yeah, I mean, I think, when, you know, when we first meet Abraham Woodhull, he's definitely someone who is, um, he has his beliefs. He, he has the things he believes in. You know, he believes he should have liberty and live in a free country. Um, but he's so reluctant. He's so reluctant to put those beliefs out there because when you put beliefs out there, it's dangerous. And he has a family and he has a kid and he has a life. A farm, he has, you know, th there is some prosperity in front of him, possibly, that he kind of maybe wants to have. And basically, you know, in the pilot episode, there's a bunch of events that all take place that lead him to this decision, which is, you have to, this is the time in history, and this is what I love about human beings, is that there comes a point where someone goes, I'm going to stand up and do something about it. And I, I've never really understood why, and thank God they do it. Thank God they do. I never understood why they do it. I don't consider myself to be someone who would take such a noble stand, but he does. And he stands up, and, and, and throughout the first season, he's really, he becomes educated as to what it is to be a spy. He becomes educated about what it means to the cause, to the people, to the enemy that he's fighting against, what it's going to do to his family, how it's going to rip his family apart, what his father believes in. And it really, the, the final episode it leads him to a moment that happens. Am I allowed to spoil this for people? Yeah. He takes a life. And as someone who we begin as this reluctant farmer who wants the war to stay away from his doorstep, he takes a life at the end. Um, which is so, for him, just so tragic, unfathomable that the war has literally, or he kills him in, in his own house. I mean, it literally has arrived on his doorstep. So season two is... Um, that has to mean something to him. That death has to mean something. So he takes his mission, his purpose, his belief, and he's willing to put all of his chips in and risk and stake everything for what he believes in and to win this war for Washington and for his son and for his future and for his family. You know, he's, he doesn't care that he might be on the wrong side of history. If the British win, it doesn't matter to him. What matters to him is to fight for what he believes in. And I respect that. And I think we should all be doing a lot more of it. Yeah, I think... Um, well, you and I spoke before season one aired, and one of the things that you said was that even though this takes place in obviously a very specific time in history, it actually is kind of a timeless story. You know, these political unrests obviously have continued. Um, so can you talk about that a little bit? You know, how would a modern day viewer sort of relate to this on a, maybe a different level? Um, there, will, there will always be oppressors, and you have to rise against your oppressors. I don't know how to say it any clearer than that. I really don't. You have to take a stand and you have to fight for what you believe in. And what's important to you, you know? It's not just, you know, for, for Abraham, I am, I'm a parent, I'm, I'm a, I'm, I have a son, I'm a father. You know, it's important to me that my son would grow up in a country where he gets to do what he wants to do and not be governed by somebody else. And this is the context of which this show takes place, is what these people are fighting for. It's the very liberties that a lot of us probably take for granted. So, yeah, I think it's about seeing an injustice and standing up and saying, hang on a sec, I don't, I don't believe in that. I mean, so much wells up inside Abe's character in that first season. You know, it's hard to imagine taking these risks. These are your three friends that you grew up with, three best friends. Um, and now in season two, not only is the ring solidified, but now they're going to grow the ring, and they're going to bring even more information to Washington. So it's bold step for people at that time, who, you know, uh, living under such oppression. Mm -hmm. Um, so, Alex, can you kind of, from a historical perspective, give us a little context about where we are um, at the end of season one and going into season two, and what actual events from the war are going to be depicted? Well, I can't give away too much, of course, but uh, I think, uh, when do we start? About 1777? Yeah. Yeah, that's where, and uh, so, you know, the, the war is in this, um, you know, when we open up uh, in episode one, you know, the, uh, the war is in this kind of... Uh, it's sort of the end of the beginning stage. We've moved into a kind of a middle, the middle game. And, uh, you know, there are contested areas around Philadelphia uh, and New Jersey and so on, which are, you know, basically changing hands uh, back and forth. And so, um, 
you know, people have to be very careful what they say and they do because nobody wants to end up on the wrong side of the fence when the, the wrong army comes marching into town. Um, so it's kind of an interest, it's interest, it's an interesting juxtaposition, I think, as, you know, as there's an increasingly gray area uh, when we see Abe actually moving or shifting towards sort of black and white. Um, it's a, sort of an interest. I think it's, it's going to be a kind of a tension in, that runs throughout the, the show. I'm not going to say a word about what this um, man does, but he has his own personal arc, uh, which I, <laughs> which um, is sort of usually from sort of bad to worse, but um, there are some high points along the way. But, uh, historically um, for Washington, we'll see how Washington survives Valley Forge. We'll Washington, the general is actually in the building. Yes. General, stand up, please. General, stand up. Yeah, George God. Washington. It's in the building. Yeah, we'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll lead up to Valley Forge. We'll be after Valley Forge. Some really great historical moment. Mm -hmm. And um, we also have the introduction of Benedict Arnold, I yes. think. Oh, yeah. Do you want yeah, to talk we'll, about that a little bit? Yes. Uh, we, we're going to see the introduction of Benedict Arnold. We're going to see Benedict Arnold as the general who had a you know, very firm relationship with George Washington. Um, you know, we'll get to see the side of Benedict Arnold. I think a lot of people don't know about it. Everybody knows about Benedict Arnold towards, you know, the end of before he's a traitor um, and, uh, and everything after him being a traitor. But people don't know what a great general he was. People don't know much about what transpired beforehand. So the show really does show that very well. You know, who could Washington trust? Who couldn't he trust? You know, what were those challenges? And Benedict Arnold did have a very firm impact on, on uh, the troops prior to uh, that turning. So we're going to learn a lot about his character and his relationship with George Washington. Um, from a storytelling perspective, was there anything that you did differently going into season two? Did you take any lessons from season one? Or I think, I think Craig's approach to season two was this ring is solidified. Abe is going to be a spy. It's going to work between him and Ben Talmadge. He's going to accept, you know, the challenge, um, and earnestly, like he believes in it. Um, as does Anna Strong. As does the group. And we're going to see the challenges for all the characters that were established in season one. Hewlett, in trying to occupy the town of Setauket, and also trying to, you know, live by the principled way he believed. Um, so each character, I think, is challenged in a different way in season two than they were in season one. And plus, we have introduction of new characters, Benedict Arnold, Robert Townsend, um, without creating any spoilers, but, you know, just sort of like we see the ring grow and we see its impact grow. Do you know what's weird on a historical show? There kind of is no spoilers because you just go on Google. <laughs> <laughs> we know who wins the war. I was thinking about that today. I was like, there's no way of giving anything away. You know what happens. Just read a history book. <laughs> Well, as an English actor, did, did you, you know, your knowledge of the war going into it, uh, did it sort of change or did you learn anything new? Yeah, they don't, they don't teach this in England. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not a point of pride. It's not. They're like, literally, they get up to a certain point, 17 or something, and they just like <laughs> jump over it and just like continue from there. It's so weird. So, I mean, oh, go ahead. Yeah, season two starts in London. It starts, you know, at the foot of King George. It's interesting. You get to see that other side that you don't see in season one. What was it for the British at the time? And I think the interesting thing about the colonies, it's not about the British troops lost, the crown lost, but many Scots, Brits, Dutch, French won who were there, who became the colonies. Um, for both Jamie and Samuel, have you... Have either of you had like a favorite scene that you filmed, maybe in season one, so that we don't give too much away? But um, well, I, I, I mean, it'd be hard to uh, beat the finale of season one. Um, it was, um, you know, that whole that whole um, tension between Hewlett and Simcoe came to a head, and um, and the, the the wheels really came off. And, uh, and Simcoe, Simcoe went on the rampage. Yeah. So uh, whilst it was savage and uh, unacceptable behavior, uh, it, was, it was really fun to do. And um, so I had a lot of fun. And also any, any time where, uh, sim, like the duel, the duel was, was a lot of fun despite it being minus 15 or something. <laughs> um, but, um, but that, you know, yeah, the, the confrontations, you know, have been a, a, a real high point throughout both seasons, actually. 
you know, whenever we get that tension really high, and particularly in season two, that's happening a lot. You know, that's um, it's really exciting for us, and hopefully exciting for everybody else too. Okay. And what about for you, Jamie? Favorite? I can tell you least favorite. Okay. What's your least favorite? <laughs> Anytime I'm in a rowing boat. <laughs> I, can't, I can't roll. See. <laughs> have you taken any lessons, or how? No, how they, is didn't that give going? Me, they didn't give me any lessons. Just said, "Can you roll?" You just get in and roll. Yeah, it didn't work. We had to reshoot like three times. And that's actually quite a quite a few scenes that you are in. L a luckily, weirdly, it's written out in season two. I don't oh. roll as much. <laughs> I don't know why that's happened, but um, yeah. Well, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Um, can you tell the audience anything about where this sort of love triangle or his relationship with Anna is going this season? Obviously, this is the part of the show that has been sort of fictionalized for television. So, so what can you what can you tease about that? I think it forward? gets more and more tricky. The 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 more that I, listen, put it this way, Abe basically lies to everyone in this season. I don't think there's a, a character that he doesn't lie to. And I think that what's interesting about it now, and I, hopefully in season three, um, <laughs> is that, is that um, he's almost better at lying than telling the truth. He's like more comfortable with lying. Than, it, it's like it comes easier to him than actually speaking the truth. So with that, when, you, when you know, his relationships, especially with his wife and with his true love, Anna Strong, who's also sitting right there, Heather Woo! Lynn plays Anna Strong. Um, those relationships are tested more and more and more because he has to lie and cover that lie and cover the other one. And he, did he did he say the lie to her or was it to her? You know, so it, it becomes for him it's confusing. But also, you know, these people aren't going to wait around for him forever to figure his stuff out. So who knows what might happen? Just leave it there. <laughs> Um, and Barry, when you and Craig first came across this book and you know brought it to AMC, what what sort of drew you to the material and what made you think that this was going to be a good show to adapt for television? Well, I wasn't aware that there were spies at that time. I wasn't aware that anything profound happened for Washington after Nathan Hale. Um, I knew a little bit about T Ben Talmadge, but not much. And so. What was fascinating is you go through Alex's book and you read about the birth of this culpa ring and you see letters, exchanges between the farmer and His Excellency George Washington. And you think, are these two people really writing to each other? Is he, does he have the daring and the, I don't want to use that word, audacity, to ask Washington to be you know, paid back for the work he's missing as a farmer? But yet he did. And he said, look, I'm doing this work for you. I need to get, pa I need money. I need to be reimbursed. And he's doing this very dangerous work, but yet he's still principled enough to know uh, this exchange has to happen. So you read those letters and you learn about the code book and, you know, all the research that Alex did, it's just fascinating. You can't believe that it worked, that they were able to provide the information that they did, and also that they were never discovered. I mean, none of this was discovered until Townsend's trunk was opened up, you know, in the 40s, right, Alex? Uh, yeah, late 30s, yeah. It's, it's, my, it's incredible. So the Culper Ring succeeds. And that's what I hope, you know, we'll get to see over seasons, many seasons, to see just how profound that success was. Mm -hmm. um, in term, can you tell us a little bit about, and this is for anybody, I guess, um, like the actual set, and I know the costumes are very intricate and, you know, in terms of the historical accuracy of some of those cultural aspects. What can you tell us about your shooting location and how much time and effort has gone into making sure that it actually does well, make We have sense? this brilliant um, production designer, Carolyn Henania, and she does a great job of looking at the pictures of the period, um, drawings, I should say pictures, not photographs, but drawings of the time. Um, and artist's rendering of the time. And she's figured out how to recreate early New York or early Brooklyn Harbor, the town of Setauket, which we built whole cloth, thanks to the support of AMC, um, uh, in Richmond, Virginia, uh, where there is enough sort of historical uh, period buildings that exist at the time that we use. And so it's a very interesting uh, mix of what still stands in Virginia and what she's been able to create um, on set. It's really uh, incredible work that she's done. We did as much research as we could. We gleaned a lot from Alex's book. But basically, we've built the town of Setauket um, inside and out. 
um, and New York Harbor and Brooklyn Harbor and Philadelphia is shot in Williamsburg, Virginia, which is, you know, if anybody hasn't been to Colonial Williamsburg, it's remarkable because it is preserved from the colonial period. So we're very fortunate to be filming there in Virginia and able to bring all of that period to life. Mm -hmm. And Alex, as far as you know, is it pretty... Well, as, a, as an author, it's really... Um, I remember the first time I was there for the shooting of the pilot, and, you're, and, and it's, it's, very, it's almost disconcerting when you, um, you know, as an author, you've, ima you've imagined everything in your head. You know, you've been writing, you've been sort of envisaging it, it's on a page, and then to see everything sort of, sort of come into sort of 3D, um, and uh, it really is, it really is uh, it's actually quite staggering because you actually, see, I mean, you walk around, you go, oh, this is the village that I was writing about, you know, it's a little Satorga. Oh, wait, this is New York City. Oh, this is very strange. You know, walking on sort of eight, the 18th century streets and seeing the inside, especially nowadays that you have the big sound stage down in Richmond, um, where you can see all the, 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 the insides of, of these houses. Um, so it's really pretty extraordinary. And then, of course, um, just in terms of the, the actors, is that the, there are no, apart from Townsend, there's no image that exists of any of the, of any of the Culper Ring. Um, and the Townsend one is from 40 years later, and it's actually not very good. Um, so when you actually, you know, when you're, when you're a historian, you're putting a story together, you're actually trying to you know, see, see the people in your head um, and put them into situations. And when you actually see uh, actors, and I'd never hung around um, you know, actors before, um, so I didn't know what I didn't know what these guys. <laughs> Who's I, knew, that mean? I, I knew they were all sort of louche, but that's all I knew. Uh, and they told them using showbiz stories or whatever they do. Um, and uh, I, and you sort of realize when you see an actor. Um, so everyone's. Oh, sorry. No, carry on, carry on. All right, that's the end of this. Uh, I sort of suffusing. Uh, a spirit and, and breathing life into characters who were once on sort of dusty pages. It really is. Um, it really does really just take you back. You realize that you know sort of history. History comes alive. It's hard um, to recreate the period. I mean, Whitehall, yeah. the home of Richard and Abe's childhood home, is actually Thomas Jefferson's childhood home, Tuckahoe. Um, it just it's remarkable. Donna Sikowska, also our wardrobe designer, does a brilliant job of creating the period. Uncomfortable though it is for Heather Lynn to wear all of those costumes, um, it's incredible like the detail that goes into that work to bring the period to life. Yeah. Um, I think we're actually going to turn it over to the audience for some questions. Okay, since part of this history happened in New York, and some of us may be a, more aware of the New York angle in history, I mean, New Yorkers were basically businessmen and Tories supporting the British because that they thought that's where the dollars were coming from. So, um, you know, your take and the way you're describing this production isn't isn't from that perspective, certainly. I think we show in the show very well the Tory and Whig perspectives, and I think we show the commerce perspectives in the show, and we try to delve into that. And I think we've tried to be as accurate as possible what the risks were for those who weren't supporting that. I mean, the Tories were supporting, you know, commerce, no doubt, and the British were commerce, but there's certainly so many other impacts there, the French impact, the Dutch impact, and, you know, what way, what direction the colonies were going to go in. So I think in a show like John Adams, they do a good job of showing it, and I think we do as good a job as possible showing it. I think, um, just, to, just could I just add one thing, I, th I think we've been very careful from the get-go not to portray uh, the revolution um, as one of these uh, sort, of, uh, sort of baddies versus goodies type fights, uh, you know, where you have sort of lantern-jawed, star-spangled heroes versus a bunch of chinless, witless wonders in the British Army. We try and, we try and get away from that kind of, that kind of creaky cliché. Um, and so what we do is we show people in Setorkut, for instance, that this, these were troubled times. I mean, people are shifting in their allegiances, their loyalties change. Uh, people, you know, people can't just throw their, um, you know, their, um, uh, you, know, can't, you know, they have to consider their families and their livelihoods and, and the reputations and so forth. Um, so it's, it's I, think we, I think we do get to the fact that in the village and in New York, you know, these are, these are very loyalist areas. Um, for you know, for fairly, fairly you know, very sensible reasons, um, and so, but you know, over time, people 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 change their opinions, and I think you may see that in the show as uh, you know, as as the British kind of outstay their welcome. So uh, again, I just wanted to 
sort of add that. Uh, what's the biggest challenge for you guys in terms of like filmmaking and acting when doing like a period piece? Like what was the hardest challenge for you guys? Yeah, I, yeah, go ahead. I think, I think um, you know, one of the hard things is um, we've touched on it a little bit about creating the, the world, um, you know, and, and it's, it's basically, it's layers of teamwork that, that make it all seem authentic. And um, I think the hardest thing is, um, is feeling confident that we've, we've really accurately got, got the time period and, 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 and we're portraying the truth of it. And we'll never really know. I mean, that's, you know, that's, a, that's the blessing and, and the curse of it. Um, but one thing that we can rely on is, is the team that surrounds us. I mean, you know, e even just picking up a period uh, pistol, there's absolutely no reason, obviously, why any of us would know how to, to use that. But um, we have exceptional people around us who have done all of that research for us. So we just, there's always somebody on hand that you can access to um, help deepen the understanding of, of, of the world. But I think um, it can sometimes seem daunting, to, uh, the, the task of, of really creating this world and, and knowing with, with real certainty what these human beings would be thinking in this moment, in the context of this world. Um, and also, but but we, we lean on the team all around us to, to make sure. that happen, don't we? Yeah, Kelly Farah, our prop master, is constantly adding pieces, you know, that would be accurate at the time of what a soldier would be wearing, what a townsperson would be wearing, and, you know, uh, weaponry, so on. Everything needs to be very accurate. Everything's quite different. Either People are either adding things or taking them away. When I'm on set, I'm often running around apologizing to everybody for how cold it is. That's a challenge. These actors are outside in the freezing cold. We shoot between September and you know, and February. And last year, in season one, was the polar vortex while we were filming. So I'm always apologizing to people for how freezing cold it is and how long they are outside on set while they're shooting. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. You're welcome. It's the I first think, time I've ever I think heard one that. of the hot <laughs> speaking as one of the um, speaking as one of the uh, of, of writers. Um, I think. That, and it was a surprise me. I think the hardest two aspects of doing a period show are A, uh, dialogue, and B, creating the right sort of atmosphere without, without losing viewers. I mean, you have to, you have, you're trying to recreate a lost and alien world of the, of the 18th century, uh, but at the same time, you have to make it relevant and understandable to modern viewers. So, for instance, with dialogue, I, you know what? I'd love to throw in a ton of 18th century jargon, but the fact is, is that you know, no one's going to get it. So you have to make sure that you, people's, you know, you, that you get that, that sort of balance right. Same with uh, atmosphere and, and, and um, authenticity. Um, you just got to make sure that, that you don't lose viewers. Because at the end of the day, you know, sort of story, uh, well, sort of, you know, facts are sort of subordinate to story. Um, I, think, I think that's the trickiest sort of balance to get right. Yeah, I think Craig had to wrestle with that all the time because yeah. he wanted the language to be as accurate as possible, but where you would understand it. You know, in the older period English, there are some words that are just require translation. You'd have to have subtitles. <laughs> um, I'm fascinated by the idea that you guys, you know, either didn't know anything about much about the revolution or that you might have had strange conceptions or perceptions. So I want to hear what you a little more about what you learned and what it, were there things that changed your ideas for all of you non-americans and also you have great socks thank you uh, I think across the board the socks are pretty good actually yeah I'm just gonna just gonna talk about the socks earlier i'm glad you brought that up um you know i mean listen i uh, i i really enjoy history I, I loved history in in school as a child um i still do you know i'm I, World War II, like, there's something about that piece of war that's so good, it's so romantic, it's so... I've been in World War II movies, like, I love that time period. Um, however, for me, there's nothing that comes close to going to work, putting on a costume of that time period, and walking onto a set where all you see is that time period, and all you're doing is living that time period. You're smelling the cow shit. You're smelling like the, you know, you, you are literally, you're eating the, 
the, you know what I mean? Like it's so tangible, it's right there. You're experiencing it. And um, for me, what I learned is I have no idea how they fought a war with those kinds of shoes. <laughs> Period, I mean, I have no, I don't know how that was done. I mean, like the marching that they did, they took, they took the winters off, right? They would break for the winter and go home for a bit, right? They yep. would garrison somewhere and just like, Yep, they would then campaign they in the summer, but right, that, makes that sense. didn't make but it a lot better, though. No, but, but uh, it's, it's, yeah. a, it's unbelievable. But that hands-on physical experience is, um, it's great. It's really what I go to work for. I mean, it's so yeah. exciting. Really and, and, and some of the best um, information that was recovered was about the conditions of troops, right? right I mean, right, that right, was right. so vital about whether you were going to attack or not attack or, you know, who was vulnerable. Right. Yeah. I remember when, in season one, there's a great conversation between Megan Warner and Heather, Heather Lynn's characters out in the snow, and it's 20 degrees, and they don't have much clothing. You know, a, there's a cloak, I think, maybe you had on, and so on. So I said, well, you know, remember one thing. During that period, this would be the, the conditions they'd be in. You know, and I remember Heather looking at me and going, not helping. It's not helping. Not feeling any warmer. That's not going to help. A little method acting. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> acting. The, the other interesting thing that, that I, I learned was uh, there were two sections to my research. One was to, because we learned nothing about the war was when we were growing up in England. It was to get a kind of an overview of what actually happened, you know, as much as, as, much as one can. And then, but then there's um, the mindset of an occupying force, uh, which is fascinating to me, and, and how you how one makes that okay in one's mind um, as a human being and, and, and what's required of you in order to achieve that, that level of calm with, with what's happening and to okay that as a human being. That's fascinating to me, you know, um, and I think, you know, it's still, that's completely relevant um, now, more as much as it was then, you know. Did you, you know, really ha did you um, find a, a commonality and, and find that they were, they had individual pursuits to rise uh, above, you know, w within their class or, you know, within, you know, the military or, you know, within, uh, and certainly uh, in your character, Roken, um, you know, we, we, we see that a bit. You seem like a combination of Tar uh, Bannister Tarleton and Simcoe you know, of the 40th Regiment of uh, Foot and the Queen's Rangers. And, uh, and so I, I was just, that was my question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, certainly the, um, for someone like Simcoe, it was, it was a career. And um, um, I think every, everyone is politicized in, in their own way. But, um, but, but yes, I mean, uh, there's, there's the overall cause um, then there's your position in, in the army, and then there's your personal life, and they're all um, equal forces. And, um, and I think, you know, one of the greatest assets of the show is, is that th three-dimensional um, perspective. And, um, and it absolutely comes from all of those things that you've talked about, you know, it, it would be a very boring show if we, if we just portrayed the historical facts uh, without the human angle on it as well. Um, so, um, but there has to be, doesn't there? You know, I mean, everybody um, can have their, their idealistic views on the world. Everybody um, has what goes on at home and then everybody also has whatever they want to achieve and how that's going in their career, you know, people are complicated, and um, this time's no different. And I think, and that is the fascinating thing about the having a look at the period again. I think Jamie, if you can just answer that quickly, and I don't think I can add anything to that that's going to be any better than that. I really don't. I think that was really eloquently put. Bless you. Um, all right. Well, we actually have to wrap up, but thanks everyone for coming today. And again, turn season two premieres next Monday at nine eight central on AMC.